Um, right, so this is a problem where we have, wait, is B10 the first one? I don't think so, actually. No, it's not. Number one, it was B2. All right, okay, here we are, B2, the correct one um, that I'm talking about. Okay, so B2, right, so in this one, um, we're looking at a reaction um, where we convert formaldehyde with hydrogen gas into methanol, right? So that's a, a you know, an important process um, in these cases. And so what we're gonna do, um, right, is just go through through all the, the, the different parts here. So part A, write the complete chemical equation to describe the standard enthalpy of formation of CH3OH liquid, or if the reaction behind the term of delta HF, right? So we're just simply writing out how we get and, and, and you know, do the, the equations for, for the heats of formation, right? So in this case right here, right? So we have three different elements that are present. So we have carbon, we have hydrogen, and we have oxygen in these scenarios. And so what we're trying to do, anytime you do any kind of heat of formation, right, you're always going to form one mole of the substance that you're looking at. There's always going to be one mole of it. And so all of the ratios always have to be adjusted in that direction, right? So you may end up with like half uh, coefficients or, or, you know, thirds or, or whatever, right? Fractional ones. Um, you know, they're, they're not always going to be perfect integers. So um, going through this right here, right? So we have those three different elements. And so the elemental forms in each case, right? So in the case of carbon, right? That's graphite. In the case of hydrogen, right, that's H2 gas. And in the case of oxygen, it's O2 gas, right? So we have all of those right there. So now all we have to do is just figure out what the coefficients are in front of all of them. So we're only making one, we only need one carbon atom to make methanol, right? So that we don't have a coefficient in front of the, the, the carbon graphite. In the case of H2, right, we're, we have, we need to have four hydrogen atoms on the right. So if we have H2, right, we have to then have two H2 in this case. And then in terms of the product, right, there's only one oxygen. And so what we need is one half O2 to form methanol, right? And so that's how you you write out the the um, you know the reaction behind the the delta H of formation, right? You always go from whatever the elemental forms are at uh, standard conditions, which is graphite, H2 gas, O2 gas, to form you know whatever the product is that you're looking at, right? So in our case, that's that's methanol uh, liquid, um, right? So if it was methanol gas, it would be the exact same thing, right? The only difference would be that the delta H of formation would be different between the two of them. Part B, calculate delta H uh, not of reaction, delta S not of reaction, and delta G not of reaction for the hydrogenation of formaldehyde reaction given above at 298K and one atmosphere. So what we can easily do for ourselves, um, in these cases, right, we can use Hess's law with the delta H of formations, right? So if we look at the, the tables that I had given um, at the back of the packet, what we see is that... Um, in the case of uh, the delta uh, uh, methanol, right, what we have is CH3OH, right? So the delta HF in that case is equal to negative 239 kilojoules per mole. Uh, the delta G... F is equal to negative 166 kilojoules per mole. And then the S naught is equal to 127 joules per Kelvin mole. Right, so all of that's for, for methanol. In the case of formaldehyde, right, what we have is the delta H of formation is equal to, where is it, H2CO gas, right? We have negative 116 kilojoules per mole. The delta G of formation, we have negative 110 kilojoules per mole. And then for the S naught, we have is 219 joules per Kelvin mole. Then if we look up H2, right, what we see is that the delta H formation is equal to zero, the delta G formation is equal to zero, but S naught is not equal to zero, right? That one is equal to 131 joules per Kelvin mole in that case, right? So we have all of those different values. Now we can just simply use Hess's law where we take 
um, add up the sum of all the delta H formations for the products, and then you know uh, subtract out then the sum of all of the delta H formation of the reactants in those cases. So to get the delta H of the reaction in this case, right? All we have then is negative. Here, let me just write it out, right? So it'll then just be in this case, the delta H of formation of the methanol. Oh, one too many carbons. OH liquid minus, and then now we have here the delta H of formation of, oh, and then one thing too, sorry, uh, to include, right, is the number of moles of them in each one of those cases. So, and delta H formation of CH2O gas plus and delta HF H2 gas, right? So we have all of that right there. And so we plug in our numbers, what we have is, right, one mole of methanol is going to be formed, right, that gets multiplied by delta HF, which is negative 239, I don't know, I may have, let me just double check, I think that's 239, yeah, 239, negative 239 kilojoules per mole minus one mole of uh, formaldehyde times delta HF in that case, which is negative 116 kilojoules per mole plus, right, the delta H of formation for H2 is equal to zero. So we have one mole times zero kilojoules per mole. And so adding all that up, what we get is Minus negative 116 comes out to negative 123 kilojoules per mole, or not per mole, sorry, because the moles all cancel out, right? The moles cancel out in all of these cases. So it's kilojoules, um, right? And so let me just double check that that's what I have on the key. It should be, yeah, negative 123 kilojoules, right? So that's a delta HF of that. And so then now what we can do is we can calculate the delta S. Right, and so then delta S in this case, not of the reaction is going to be equal to um, the number of moles, right, times S naught of the reactants, right, so that's just simply uh, the methanol times the number of moles times the S naught of formaldehyde, right, so CH2O gas plus the number of moles of H2, right? So S naught H2 gas. And so that comes out to being one mole times S naught, which is 127 joules per Kelvin mole minus, now in parentheses we have 219 joules, or sorry, one mole. times 219 joules per Kelvin per mole plus one mole times, right? And then the important thing is, right, there there is an entropy associated with the elemental forms, right? It, it, there may be no delta HF and no delta G F in those cases, right? But there is an S naught F in those scenarios, right? So we have then in this case, 131 joules per Kelvin per mole and so then moles cancel, moles cancel, moles cancel. So what we get is um, 127 minus 219 plus 131 comes out to negative 223 joules per Kelvin, right? And so that's an important thing always to remember, remember, right, is that delta S is always going to be in joules per Kelvin or right energy unit over Kelvin in those cases, while delta G and delta H are always just simply going to be in the energy units in those scenarios. Um, so that's how you get then the, the delta S, not the reaction. Now, um, there's two ways that you can approach doing the delta G. So you can either use the Hess's law approach, where you just simply add up 
um, all of the different uh, values in those cases, or you can just simply use delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, right? And so I can do both of those. They should come out to being exactly the same numbers. And uh, so if I, if I do that, right, so if I go the one route, right, if I go the Hess's law route, we have delta G not of the reaction is going to be equal to the number of moles of um, times delta G naught of the formation of methanol. So CH3OH liquid minus the sum of the two reactants, right? So that's then going to be N delta G F naught of CH2O plus N times delta G not F of H2. So we plug in the numbers. And what we get then is, right, one mole times the delta GF is negative 166 kilojoules per mole minus, in big parentheses, one mole times the delta GF of the formaldehyde is negative 110 kilojoules per mole plus one mole times, right? And then again, for H2, right, because it's the elemental form, um, that's going to be just simply equal to zero. So it's just simply zero uh, kilojoules per mole, right? So moles cancel again and everything. And so what we get then is the delta G naught of the reaction is equal to negative 166 minus negative 110, which comes out to negative 56 kilojoules in that case, right? Which matches what I have on the key. So that's one way that you can do it, right? Is you can use the Hess's law approach. The other way that you can do it, right, is you can just use then the standard delta G approach. Let me just delete everything from right here. Do, do, do. Right, where you have delta G naught uh, is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught, right? So you can use that approach as well in that case. And so if we were to do that, right, delta H naught, we already calculated that's negative 123 kilojoules. One important thing I'm going to point out, right, is that um, the delta S, right, is in joules whereas the delta H is in kilojoules. And so they're different scales in those cases, right? So you have to either choose to convert the delta S into kilojoules, right? By dividing by a thousand or converting the delta H from kilojoules into joules by multiplying by a thousand. For me, it's a lot easier to just simply multiply by a thousand because you're just simply adding three zeros uh, essentially to the end um, in this case, right? So I'm gonna have 123,000 joules minus the temperature, right? And so we're at standard condition, so that should be 298 Kelvin times the entropy that we calculated here, right? So that's negative 223 joules per Kelvin, right? So the Kelvins cancel, so everything is in joules. So we get then delta G naught is equal to, right? Negative 123000 joules minus 298 times negative 223, which comes out to negative 56,546 joules, right? Which is basically the same thing that I have here, right? The only difference is just simply the cutoff points, you know, um, in those cases, right? In terms of, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, rounding up or rounding down, right? Sig figs and stuff like that. So, um, right, so you get, Either way, right, you're gonna get essentially the same answer, um, right? They're both they're both valid. They're both correct. Um, so that's how you so that's how you do part B, um, right? Is you just simply use Hess's law for the most part for for sure for delta H and delta S, and then for delta G, right? You can choose either one in those cases. So now the next question is, right? Part C is is the reaction spontaneous at standard states, 298 Kelvin and one bar, um, right? So that's where we're at. Um, and so, uh, right, one bar, one atmosphere, right, they're pretty close, pretty similar. Um, so that's not going to be the thing that really pushes it. So all you really have to do in those cases, right, to figure out if something is going to be, if a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not, is to look at the delta G value 
And if the delta G is negative, it's spontaneous. And if it's positive, it's not spontaneous. Um, and so looking at ours, right, we have negative 56 uh, kilojoules as our answer. So then that tells us, right, it's the negative value. So yes, it will be spontaneous. And that's all you have to really figure out for that part right there. Um, the next part of the question um, is, right, calculating the temperature in Kelvin when K is equal to one, right? And so when K is equal to one, the concentrations of the reactants is going to be equal to, um, right, the, 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 you know, multiplying the, 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 the other concentrations, right? So if we're thinking about, you know, Q in these cases, right, um, right, that's just simply going to be the partial pressure of, not the partial pressure, right, the concentration of, um, sorry, going back, right, it's a liquid, so the liquid isn't even going to be part of the 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 k value and stuff like that, right? That so that'll just simply be q is equal to one over, right? Because there's no gas or aqueous solution as a product, right? So that's just simply going to be one, right? So the activity is one for all of the um, products, but then underneath, right, what we're going to have then is you know the pressure of the uh, formaldehyde and then also the pressure of the H two gas. But we don't even have to think about that part, right? Because we're just simply trying to figure out when K is equal to one in those scenarios. So um, all we have to do is we can just simply use the Van Toft equation to do that because we know what delta G is in those scenarios. So to, to do that, right, to figure out what the temperature is in those cases, what we can do is then think about the, the, the case, right, where we have uh, delta G is equal to delta G naught plus... RT natural log of Q in this case, right? And what we want to have is, right, Q be equal to K be equal to one in this scenario. Um, and so uh, um, to, to, to figure out, you know, oh, wait, this is the wrong equation right here. Sorry. I'm going too far ahead, right? So all we have to do in this case, right, is just simply use this equation, right, where it's delta G naught is equal to negative RT natural log of K um, in that case. Sorry about that, um, right? Because the delta G without the not, right? That's a different uh, um, scenario where you're then looking at when you're not at equilibrium, um, what's going on, right? Because the, the equilibrium value <clears throat> um, uh, is dependent right upon the uh, um, the temperatures in these cases, right, if you if you remember the Van Toft equation. So, um, so, right, so this is the equation we use, right, is delta G naught is equal to negative RT, uh, natural log K, right, K is equal to one. We know what delta G is, right, we just calculated that, so that's negative 56 kilojoules. We know what R is, right, because that's just simply the, the gas constant, right, so the gas constant that we would use here, right, is the one that has the energy units, so that's the 8.314 joules per Kelvin moles um, in these cases, and so you can, you know, uh, uh, drop the mole part out of it because that's not going to be relevant in this scenario um, in terms of, you know, things canceling out. And so what we can do is we can rearrange this equation, right, to get to what the temperature is. So we're trying to figure out, oh, we're trying to figure out the temperature in this scenario. So all we have to do is then just simply take delta G naught and divide that by negative R natural log of K, right? That's going to be equal to T in this case. And so we can now plug in our values, right? So we have uh, the delta G. So I'm just going to simply convert that into joules, right? So that way the R values, right? The, the scaling matches up again. So this is going to be negative 56,000 joules over negative 8.314 joules per Kelvin, right? And then natural log of one is what we need right there. So we take all of this and plug all of that in. Um, wait a second. That isn't going to work. Because the natural log of 1 is equal to 0. And you're going to be dividing by 0. And that doesn't work in that scenario. So I'm trying to remember now what the correct approach is in this case. Um... Oh, wait a second. We know what delta H is, right? And 
right? So we know what delta H is in this case. We have that value. So what we have to do is we have to use the Van Toft equation, but we have to use a different one in these cases. So the first thing that we have to do, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So right, yeah, right. So the reason that you can't use that equation and that approach is because you end up with um, the uh, uh, a natural log of zero, right? Which which isn't um, doable in those cases. But what we can do, right, is use the equation natural log of k two over k one. Um, or actually, no, we don't even need to do that, right? We can just simply use uh, the natural log of k is equal to negative delta H over R, one over T plus delta S over R, right? We can use that equation now in this case right here, right? So that would be the, the correct equation to use. So um, because now, right, what we can do is we know what delta H is, we know what delta S is, um, right? Because we can assume that it stays the same, you know, across the, the, the full temperature range. Um, right, natural log of k is equal to zero, right? We know what r is in these cases, so we can rearrange everything the way that we want to. So if uh, what we can do is, right, so we have the natural log of k, um, right? So that's gonna be equal to zero, right? So that then gives us delta h over r, one over t plus delta s over r, right? So we can rearrange this now. So what we have is negative delta s over r, is equal to negative delta H over R one over T in this scenario um, right here, right? So, and we're still trying to solve for T. So what we can do next, right, is just simply multiply both sides by temperature, right? So now what we get is negative delta S over R um, times T is equal to negative delta H over R in this case. And so now if we divide both sides by negative delta S over R, what we get is T is equal to negative delta H over R over negative delta S over R in this case. <coughs> um, and so we get that, right? So then the negatives cancel, the R's cancel. So it just simply be, is delta H over delta S for the temperature for K is equal to one. And so we plug in the numbers that we have. Uh, so what we got was, let me just scroll back a, a brief moment, right? We have oh, negative 123,000 joules. joules over the delta S value, right, which was negative 223 joules per Kelvin, right? So the joules cancel, the Kelvin gets brought up. So the temperature we get is negative 123, 123 divided by negative 223 gives us 552 Kelvin as our value, right? And that's, I believe, what I have here. Yeah, 552 Kelvin, right? So that's so that's the correct equation to use in this case, um, right? And so you don't have to do the delta G stuff, right? Because you're just going to end up with um, a value of zero, and it's not going to allow you to evaluate what the temperature is. So what you have to use is the Van Toft equation, right? Um, in this case, right here. Um, and then you just, you know, do some rearranging and everything like that. So that what you end up with is delta H over delta S, um, in those cases, right? And so then you can divide those two by each other, right? And then you, you know, the temperature should come out in those cases, right? So 552 Kelvin is the answer in that scenario. The next part of the question, is the spontaneity of this reaction due to the enthalpy or the entropy of the reaction? Explain your answer, right? So if we go back, um, right? Well, we don't have to even go back, right? Because we know what delta H is, right? So that's negative 123,000 uh, joules. The delta S, right, we know is negative 223. So if we just simply look at the, the delta G equation, 
Uh, give me a second. Right, so if we just look at the delta G equation, um, in these cases, right, so delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, right? So if we look at that equation right there, we know we want the delta G to be negative in these scenarios. So there has to be something that pushes the overall values of the delta H and the delta S, right, when they're, when they're combined together to being negative in those cases. And so if we look at you know our equation right here, right, we have delta H is negative, but we also have that the delta S is negative in this in this scenario right here. So what's happening, right, is if you have a negative value and you multiply and, right, and then you subtract that from a different value, right, that basically becomes a positive value. And so that's kind of like fighting against the number becoming more negative. Um, and so the delta S is actually, right, the entropy of the reaction is actually working against the spontaneity of the reaction. And so um, there's going to be a certain, you know, temperature where you actually, you know, the reaction actually stops being um, uh, spontane uh, uh, spontaneous, right? And that's going to be above 552 Kelvin, right? Because the moment we're above 552 Kelvin, K in that scenario, right, starts to become less than one. And so it starts to become, you know, uh, reactant favored. And so the reaction then stops above 552 K, right? Whereas below 552 K, you know, it's going to keep going. And you can just verify that for yourself too, right? You can, if you take, you know, negative 123,000, right? Minus, and now let's just say we're doing 600 Kelvin or even just 553, right? So if we do 553 Kelvin times uh, negative 223 in that case, right? What we get is a positive 319 joules, right? Is what the delta G value is, right? So now the delta G is positive, And so it's not spontaneous, right? The reaction stops moving forward in that case, right? In the in, in terms of the conditions that we're at right now in, at the standard conditions. So, um, so in, in this case right here, right? The, the, the reaction is, you know, driven by the enthalpy, not by the entropy, which also makes sense, right? If you go back and, and you look at just simply what the equation is, um, you know, it's it's two gases forming to make, you know, one liquid, right? So you're going down in entropy in that case, right? So the entropy, you know, is, is working against what's going on. The thing that, you know, works in its favor is that you do release heat, but it's just that at a certain temperature, um, you know, it, it breaks down and um, doesn't move forward anymore. So those are the things to always think about when you're thinking about the spontaneity and and the signs of everything. So you know if, if you wanted to go you know down other rabbit holes, right? So if it was a different scenario where now we have you know delta G, you know you want it to be negative and delta H is positive and delta S is positive, in these cases, you're going to have a scenario then where it's entropically driven, right? Right? Because the delta S value is positive, and so then that means that's going to be reducing the total number overall, whereas the delta H, right, is positive. And so that's going to be, you know, increasing it. Um, and so in those cases, reactions at higher temperature are unfavorable, whereas reactions at lower temperature then are favorable, right? And so that's where you have then that flip um, in those cases in terms of what's actually driving the spontaneity between them. You know, you can have, an, uh, you know, the, the best scenario that you can have, Right uh, would be the case where you have a negative entropy, sorry, enthalpy and a positive entropy. Right, so that's always going to be spontaneous because it doesn't matter what the temperature is. Right, the delta S value is always going to become, uh, um, you know, contributing, you know, a negative value, you know, at any temperature, so to say. Right, the delta H is always going to be negative, and so in those cases, right, those always come out to being negative in those cases. Right, so this is just kind of going over things. Right, so this is you know, uh, um, low temperature. Right. This is high temperature. Um, <clears throat> um, and then um, in this case right here, all temperatures, right? And so the last scenario, right, where, where um, you know, you can go, right, is if you have the things flipped, right? You have a positive um, enthalpy, right? And you have a negative entropy. Those are always going to be, right? Those aren't, it doesn't matter what the temperature is. Right, you're never ever gonna have a spontaneous reaction in those scenarios because the delta H is positive, right? And then, you know, the since the delta S is negative, 
Um, it doesn't matter what temperature you're at, right? That's always going to be right. A negative times a negative. That's always going to be a positive, right? So that's always going to be contributing and increasing, you know, the positivity of the value, right? The delta H is always increasing the positivity of the delta G value. So those will always be positive values, right? So there's never a scenario where a positive delta H, you know, an, you know, a, an endothermic reaction with uh, a delta S that's uh, a negative <clears throat> will 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 be spontaneous, right? Will will occur. Um, so those are the things to, to keep in mind in those cases for that. Um, last part of the problem, right, kind of goes back a little bit to, um, you know, the, the previous two weeks of, of packets going over, um, you know, uh, work, heat, and change in enthalpy. So what you're given, right, in this case is for the reaction of one mole of formaldehyde gas with one mole of hydrogen gas, assume all gases are ideal, and the reaction goes to completion to form one mole of liquid methanol at constant 298 Kelvin and one bar. So, right, the reaction that we have is CH2O gas plus H2 gas, right, forms CH3OH liquid, right? So that right there is the reaction. So we're at constant pressure, right? We're, we're, uh, um, you know, having a reaction happen in this scenario. And so the ideal gas, right? The, the rules that we would apply and think about for, um, ideal gases on their own, right? If it was just simply a regular expansion or compression, don't directly relate in that regard where, where we're thinking about, um, you know, how Q and work, all right, heat and work are related um, in those scenarios, and right. And if you're looking at it and you're like, "Oh, it's at constant temperature," right? That's going to be an isothermal process, right? That only matters if you're doing purely gas expansion compression, right? What we're doing here is a reaction, and because we're doing a reaction in this case, then that means that at constant pressure, right? That means that delta H is equal to QP in this case, right? So we've already calculated delta H earlier on, right? We already know what the delta H of this reaction is. That is, what was it? Negative 123 kilojoules, right? So we already know how many mole, right? Because we're using one mole of everything, right? So that just perfectly, you know, matches onto um, the delta H naught that we had of the reaction, right? That we'd already calculated. And so we know how much heat's being released from this case right here. The next thing, right, is going to be the work, right? And so work, you know, uh, um, you know, it's going to be irreversible work. Uh, right. So we know it has to then, you know, match, you know, negative Pelta P Delta V in this case, looking at this reaction, right. What we can see is that we're going from having essentially an overall two moles of gas starting off, right. Cause you have one mole of formaldehyde and one mole of H2 gas. Um, and then, you know, at the end, we don't have any moles of gas, uh, right. Cause it's all going to be converted into liquid in this case. And so, you know, Delta N in this case is going to be equal to negative two moles um, in this scenario. And so thinking back, right, to I think the packet two weeks ago, right, the week seven packet, um, we can rearrange the negative P delta V equation, right? So that way, you know, using the ideal gas equation so that it, we actually are just simply looking at it from a perspective of negative delta NRT, right? Where we're just looking at the change in moles of, um, you know, the reaction, pro you know, process in this case, right? Because we are, we, we know R, right? That's the ideal gas constant, right? And then the one that we would use because we're trying to get work, right, is the 8.314 joules per Kelvin uh, moles, right? We know the temperature, right? That's going to be at 298 Kelvin. And so from there, right, we can calculate what the work is. Um, and so if we go here, right, and we plug in our numbers, right? So now we have delta N, right? We know that's negative two moles, right? So we have negative, negative two moles, um, right, we have R, which is 8.314 joules per Kelvin moles, right? And then we know what the temperature is, which is 298 Kelvin in this case. And so Kelvin cancels, moles cancels. And so we take all of that and we plug all of that in. Um, and what we get is negative times negative 2 times 8.314 times 298. We get... 4,955 joules, right, which is basically five kilojoules, which is what I have here, um, you know, as the answer in that case, right? So that's how you calculate work in this scenario. And so delta E, right, still the same thing as before, right, where it's just simply Q plus work. And so we just simply add up the values that we have. So we have negative 123 kilojoules plus five kilojoules. And so that comes out to negative 123 plus five negative 118 kilojoules.
And that's how you that's how you calculate all of it. And then again, why it's not isothermal. So the reason that we don't consider this to be an isothermal expansion or compression is because it's not just simply it's not uh it's at a constant temperature, but the what's happening is that it's a reaction. It's not just simply, you know, outside forces pushing on gases and making them compress and go out, right? It's actually a chemical transformation that's happening. And so that's why you know, the, 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 the approach of thinking of it from an isothermal compression or expansion doesn't match in this case, right? Because what you're looking at in those scenarios, right, is what you're, uh, uh, the, the, you know, you have a gas and, you know, in terms of the number of moles, it stays exactly the same in terms of the composition of what type of molecule it is, it stays exactly the same, right? None of those change, um, in those cases. And so in those cases, right, what you're getting is then the compression or expansion based off of, you know, outside forces, right? You have, you know, either a pressure uh, uh, being applied um, or, you know, being reduced on the system, but you're keeping it at the same temperature. Whereas in this case right here, what we're doing is actually a chemical reaction. And so we're changing the number of moles that we have within our system. And so um, in that regard, right, we're not considering the, um, um, the implications of uh, the temperature on the outside, right? Because the delta H is being changed by the reaction. Um, whereas like in an isothermal system, you know, what, what you're getting in those scenarios, right, is that there's no temperature change that happens there um, because it's isothermal, right? Because it all stays exactly the same. But you're, but that's because you're actually not changing any bonds or releasing any heat or doing anything with the actual molecules. Um, and so that's so that's a very important thing to distinguish um, when we're reading through these problems, right? If it's a chemical reaction that's happening, right? You're gonna have a delta H value, even if it's at the, you know, if the temperature of the system doesn't change. Whereas in the case of, um, the only the only thing is I'm right then the you know all of the the heat that gets generated and gets you know used is is coming from the delta H right whereas in the case of the um um just a gas completely on its own right in those cases what happens is that you get then you know the compression um and expansion where you have an outside force acting on these molecules that aren't changing at all um, right. So there's, there's nothing that's changing there in those cases. Right. So there are two different scenarios, right? So when, when, when you, when you do, um, you know, think about those conditions, you have to think about, is it a reaction that's happening or is it just simply somebody applying pressure or reducing pressure on the systems? Right. So, so those are two different scenarios and two different approaches for how, how to solve the problems, um, in those cases. So. Does that answer it, Aquarius? Okay, yep, yeah, cool. Um, right, so those are always like the big things to think about is like what what's the actual thing that's happening? Um, cool, so that's B2, um, which took 30 plus minutes to talk about, but I, but I did go through a lot of different steps. So next part, B9 consider. So I wonder if part of B9 is because I had the wrong answers originally, um, because I wasn't paying attention. Um, uh, could you also use the same logic and say it can be, can't be adiabatic? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Because again, right. It's not an, it's not, it's not an expansion or compression, where you're just simply changing temperature or change, right? Where, where you, right? Because it's not, because you're changing the actual molecular structure. It has a very different, um, um, approach to it than if it's just straight up. I have these, you know, I have these molecules and they're just simply hanging out. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, changing the temperature or changing the pressure or, or, or whatever, right. Um, you know, in, in those cases, because, um, again, right. There's going to be there, right. For the reaction, right. There's heat that's being released by, by the reaction happening. Right. So in this case, right, it's negative 123 kilojoules. So, you know, Q isn't equal to zero in the, in that scenario, right. There's, there's heat that's being released. It's not an outside force acting on it, right. And changing the pressure or changing, um, the, 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 you know, the temperature or anything like that of the system now, right. In like a real world scenario, right. You have to start 
factoring all those things in because, you know, um, it's not all going to just simply happen in isolation, right? There is going to be a temperature change, obviously, right? If, if heat's being released, um, more than likely, right, it's going to get absorbed by the new molecules as well, right? And that's going to affect stuff. And there's a whole bunch of things that happen that you have to take into account. But if we're just straight up just thinking about what's happening directly with this reaction, right, then that's, um, that's the approach to take, right? Where, you know, the if it we're at constant pressure, right, the delta H is equal to the Q, Right, we can calculate the work as irreversible work um, in these cases, um, and because again, it's a reaction, and so the number of moles are changing. Right, it's not the temperature that changes, because that's the thing. Right, when you when you know the the typical work, right, when you have you know work is equal to negative p delta v, if it's just a straight up gas and there's no change in the moles, right, because there's no reaction or anything like that's happening, right, what you're actually looking at, um, right, is this scenario, right, that you could also then calculate because there has to be a temperature change that's associated with it where you then just simply have NR delta T, right, um, in those cases, right? So both of those should match um, in those cases, right? And then, you know, if you know what delta T is, right, that's how you're calculating Q in the, you know, uh, constant pressure, um, right, isobaric, um, you know, gas expansions and compressions um, in those scenarios, right? And so, because R is always a constant, right? So that doesn't matter. Um, but you know, that's the thing to 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 focus on and think about.